Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, and we'll call this you know, part of the Israel uh, Top Israel Entrepreneur Series, also Top E-Commerce Series. And um, before I formally introduce Yanni, I just want to say I like to point people you know, to other episodes that are cool and fun. And you know, when it's speaking of Israel, some of the the really cool episodes you should check out is. Uh, I had Moise Navone of Mobileye. And if you've not heard of Mobileye, they were actually acquired by Intel for $15.3 billion. And, but what struck me with that conversation was not the huge exit that they had, but it was the sacrifice in the journey. And at one point he had to go back to his wife and his kids and say, I'm pulling you out of all extracurricular activities and there's no more eating out and there's no more niceties uh, because of the position they were in at the time of a company. And even companies like that go through the, the struggles. And it was, you know, it, I don't know, maybe therapy a little bit, Yanni, to hear even those companies experience those things. And uh, Auto Lead Star founder, Aron Horwitz, Alana is amazing over there. They're doing some really cool things in the, uh, the car space for lead generation. And um, Adam Feldman of Kendigo, who I don't know if you know him, Yanni, but you should. They're doing stuff in, in e-commerce. So we'll have to make an introduction to uh, Kendigo, who is also in Israel, and help different e-commerce brands scale with ads. So you could, we could uh, make an introduction there. Uh, before I introduce Yanni, um, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, uh, which I co-founded with my business partner. Um, at Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships and partnerships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. Um, and so, you know, for me, Yanni, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at a way to give to my best relationships. Over the past over 10 years, I have found no better way to have the people I admire, the, what they're doing, their companies, their thought leadership on my podcast, profiling them and what they're working on. So if you have thought about starting a podcast, you should. I believe every business should have a podcast. If you want an easy button for that, with the strategy, uh, email us uh, on Rise25. You can go to rise25.com and click on the contact us and happy to answer any of the questions you have. John and I both have been doing it for over 10 years uh, when people didn't even know what a podcast was. So check it out. Today's guest, um, thank you to Kellyanne Fidio and Paul Miller of Amazing Exits because that's how I know today's guest, Yanni Kuzminski. And he's founder and CEO of Scala and Multiply Me. He's Australian born, but lives in Israel. And a scholar consulting and multiple I mean, staffing takes a holistic approach to scaling all things digital. And I agree with your, your philosophy. I mean, I don't know who wouldn't, but it's built on the idea that the right people building with the right process, you will see business growth, business success. And that's really what this combination is. And Multiply Me identifies the best talent in the Philippines, overlays it with your human resource functions, uh, because really, you know, the hiring selection, the orientation, the ongoing performance management, it's something that takes a lot of stuff off of people's plates. And like, that's what I say with the, with the podcast is like, if you're project managing it, or if you are, don't have a project manager for it, you are the project manager, right? And the same thing goes for the hiring process. We don't sometimes don't value our own time in this overlay. Oh, I'll just go on and I'll find this person. And then we have to um, orient them and onboard. Like there's a, a real cost in a business owner and CEO to do those things. And his company helps take that off your plate and shortcuts it for you. So uh, Ascala Consulting is, they have a boutique process improvement and digital transformation, which we'll dig into. And their clients can be anywhere from, 1 million to 50 million annual revenue, but they have a lot of six and seven figure rollups that they're currently working on in various stages. So you can definitely check out their websites. And prior, which we'll dig into, uh, Multiply Me and Escala, he scaled an Amazon business from two, took it from 2 million to 5 million in just a year, utilizing all his experience that he brings into helping, you know, hire and train people that can help your business. So, yeah, I think that's accurate, but, uh, Thanks for joining me. 
Thanks for the incredible introduction. Uh, I feel like I'm at school here learning how to do podcasting right. So this is this is great. Can I, does anyone call you Doc? Do you get Doc? Yeah, of course. <laughs> well, Doc, yeah. uh, this is awesome to be here and yeah. uh, just uh, appreciate, you know, the opportunity. Yeah, my, you know, my background you know, is in biochemistry and as a chiropractor. So people are like, what's the doctor? It's like, no, I, I you know, can fully treat patients and, and do all that thing, all that stuff. So um, that is, that is where that comes from. But, um, you know, I want to start off with, I mentioned the mobilize story and it strikes me and we'll get into, cause I love to hear your process and methodology for hiring and training and, and onboarding because it's so critical. The systems in, in the hiring it is critical. It's a non-sexy stuff that makes businesses run properly and smoothly. And so I'm going to have you talk about that. But I wanted to start with kind of before Multiply Me in Escala, which is, you know, I mentioned the, you help scale this Amazon business um, from 2 million to 5 million. And um, it's cool. It's interesting how I want you to talk about the entry point, how you entered into that business and then what happened. Yeah, for sure. Well, um, I would say that it started you know, a decade before that, um, before I entered that business and sort of where it began is I, I spent my career in, in agency land. So I worked in creative and digital agencies in Australia and then the U S. And so I got very quickly aware as to, you know, what it looks like to have a great developer or designer or content creator or PPC specialist or Facebook marketer. You know, personally, I've probably invested over $20 million in Facebook media spend over my career with clients like Sony and MasterCard and Mercedes-Benz. So, you know, my whole career was built on growing up in agencies and building agencies. And so when I entered the Amazon space as a, as a seller, I'd already had the blueprint of what it takes to run a business like this from an agency standpoint, which, you know, for, for those who aren't familiar, agency versus client side, client side typically are going to be larger corporates that are sort of defining the roadmap but leveraging agencies to do the delivery work. Whereas if you come from agency side, you're not only really building the strategy, but you're actually doing the delivery too. So I came from sort of a hands-on approach in the delivery mechanic and stepping into that Amazon business. Um, to give you some context here, there were three guys running around. They were doing $2 million a year. It had taken them two, two and a half years to get to that point. And they were a little bit lost, uh, which, mm. you know, which is where sort of we sit today as well in the consulting business is that, you know, there are moments in time where it becomes a little bit too hard for just the owner, operator, founder to run a complete operation, whether it's Amazon or anything else, e-commerce related and beyond. Um, there's only so much that us as human beings can handle in, you know, in one swept, you know, foul swoop. So I came into that business and I effectively built out the operational infrastructure. So what it looks like from a, you know, what does your marketing team look like? Who do you need? Rather than having the founder doing PPC management and handling customer support and using a million fake aliases of names and going to inventory and logistics and supply chain and QA from China, like what, what I did, the first thing I did was I assessed the business. And I looked to understand what was working and what wasn't. And I started to build the infrastructure as to yeah. who do we need and how are they going to operate and what does that look like? And so I guess my, my access point was really building out the team and I built it out of the Philippines and building out the processes, policies, and procedures to enable scale so we could give value across all the products, not just the hero one or two products. Yeah, I think, um, Yanni, we'll keep the, the company anonymous because I know they've sold um, and everything, but, but how did you even find the company? And then what did you come to the table with as far as an offer goes, as far as like, okay, I'm going to put money in, I'm going to put sweat, sweat equity in, I'm going to take a percentage because I don't, it's a very, it seems like a, a very no brainer offer potentially is, hey, I can come in. So how'd you find them? And then what did you, wh how'd you structure like an offer? And you don't have to share yeah. exact numbers. No, no, no. This is general. great. This is a great, I've never been asked that question before. And it's something that took a long time to figure out. And it's something that, you know, I mulled over and so did they for a long time. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a negotiation game. So, so 
I'll tell you. They're like, Yanni, um, listen, we already spent like a lot of sweat equity on this. We built this yeah, up yeah. to $2 million. Well, you're going to come in here and swoop up and whatever. So, um, And who the heck are you? We don't know you. We've built this business. We've yeah. worked together. There were two co-founders. So yeah, totally. So, How did you find them? Start, start there for a second. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what happened in the lead up to finding them. So, so I started building my own agency and it was successful pretty much from day one. It was generating a profit. I think by month two or three, I was doing about 20,000 in monthly recurring revenue and delivering all the services that I knew how to deliver and, you know, helping a lot of brands. And I realized probably six months in that as much as I could do this, I wasn't happy doing it. I, I didn't, I didn't want to take that solopreneur route. It wasn't how I was wired. I like to bounce ideas off people. And, you know, everyone likes to be a decision maker, but I like to have a collaborative decision. I want other people's opinion and I want to, as a team, make a good decision because, you know, you, you can be too close to a process and, and sort of lose sight of what you're doing. So I made the decision to say, right, even though I've got a successful agency that I'm building, I want partners. I want to go down this journey with someone else. And so, I started meeting pretty much everyone I could in Tel Aviv that was connected to, you know, I, I sort of realized if I had a product that was my own, I could market it. I could sell it. I knew what to do. I knew how to build it. I've been doing it my whole career. So I wanted to get to that point where I had partners who, who ticked the boxes that I couldn't. And that was, you know, production from China, inventory, supply chain, and logistics. I didn't want to have to figure out a whole other thing. I got down the drop shipping route. I'd built a you know, a, a successful dropshipping business and it wasn't really building a brand. So I met these guys, I got introduced to them. There was a dance for honestly way too long, uh, but, you know, maybe six, six or so months we were going back and forth. And I said to them candidly, I don't, I don't care if you offered me half a million dollars a year today, I'd still say no to the opportunity. I'm not interested in the money today. All I'm looking for is an opportunity to build something where I'm invested in it. And together, the sum is greater than the parts and we're going to be able to have a serious impact. So the, the period was I took a salary that was beyond, below, um, you know, I was going to say below the poverty line. But honestly, you couldn't live on a wage like that inside of Tel Aviv. Um, it's the fourth most expensive city in the world. And I committed to it. And I said, right, I'll prove myself out over a six-month period. I'll buy into the business. I'll go through this whole process because I'm committed to showing the impact I could have. And, you know, after that period, um, you know, technically speaking, I passed their tests, but, um, you know, it, it didn't work out the way I'd have liked. And it was honestly one of the more valuable experiences I've had in my life. But that was, that was it. it was a real dance going back and forth. Like I wanted, you know, they wanted to offer me 1% of equity, you know, and, and, and some ridiculous amount for, the decade of experience I'd had with some of the biggest brands in the world, building it out. And, you know, eventually we got to a point where we both felt like this was a fair deal. In hindsight, I probably still would have been shortchanged, but the reality is, you know, it happened for a reason and it was a great experience. Yeah. And we'll get to that because we were talking a little before we hit record about a low point and that kind of will lead into the conversation about multiply me and Escala. But but on that point, so did you come, what was the combination? It was a combination of salary, equity, and equity. Is that what you came to? Um, yeah. It was like, yeah, okay, so I'm, I'm, you're comfortable enough to move forward. Yeah. So it was the equity play uh, in the business and knowing that I could have impact in you know, the revenue and the growth around that. So that was a big driver for me in terms of also, and you know, I never really got there, but Decision making too. Um, it was really important for me that I could actually affect the decision and not be boxed into, you know, the, the things for me that haven't worked in the past. And it's not that I'm this absolute genius that has it all figured out because I'm not. But, you know, I was always sort of caged in my ability to give valuable insights into things that right. I would have believed to have had impact. And so that was a big draw card having sort of voting rights there. And yeah, you know what? I was on. Again, I wasn't on the salary I was on when I lived in the US and was working in agency land, but it was a decent salary to live. I didn't have to start from zero um, like I've had to do since and go through that start, starting journey. So it felt like a fair trade-off. So um, what, did you have to put in any money at all 
at the yes, time? Yes, I, I, I did. It's interesting. Did. So you took a salary, but you had to invest money and you got equity at the same time. And you were, you were, that was fine with, for you. And, and then, so you go on and you build, you know, go take it from two to $5 million in 12 months. And then there's a low point in there. What happened? Yeah. So, I mean, and you know what, this would be advice that I'd give to, to anyone, um, you know, not, and you don't have to take me at my word here, but I think one thing that I learned in this whole experience is that when things don't feel right, they're probably not right. And so I would say that probably not from day one, but from pretty early on, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't the right vibe. I had two partners that didn't see eye to eye and I walked into a bit of a shit storm, if I'm honest. Did you in, realize that at the time or was it more over time that you saw that? It took me, it took me several months okay. to, to truly understand the impact, but it was probably, it was probably, you know what? And, it, you know, again, we're all learning here. We're all growing. But w- when I look at it, you know, three to six months in, I truly understood the fact that this was not salvageable. Like their relationship as business partners was not salvageable. What was the, and, what was the problem that you saw? I mean, if I'm super candid, I feel like one of the partners was, I don't know how to put this uh, nicely, but, you know, <laughs> bordering on sociopathic behavior. <laughs> um, whereas the, the things other they one, were saying was maybe not what other people were seeing as reality. Like they yes, were saying that, things that and, would, that would be I'll, I'll, like the situation yeah. was this. I had two partners who'd built a successful business together that the two of them had decided that the other wasn't cut out to work together. And so not only am I trying to build this business infrastructure and grow the company, but I'm also playing therapist for, you know, the entire, virtually the entirety of working there. So, you know, it gets to a point when you want to talk about a low point, like you've got your personal life, you're trying to build a business, you've got, you know, 10, 15, 20 employees on top of that, that you genuinely care about and you want to make sure that they're getting paid. You, you're, you're spending all of your waking hours working on the business. And then after hours, you're sitting there and you're having a discussion with one of them. And then the other. It's a hard enough as it is. And then it just adds these layers of complexity to it. Yeah. So, so for me, like that entire experience through, you know, I was probably, you know, there was a year that I was really dedicated with them. Yeah. The six months in the lead up, there was probably 18, there was probably a six month courting period where I was involved in the business until I, fully committed in that year that I was committed saw the exponential growth, but the, that was really, you know, that was the start of, you know, when we started, when you started talking about the low point, that was it is, is that it's enough to just try and manage a business and the people that run it, let alone the emotional instability and their constant fighting between two partners where you've come into the party late too. I just want to, I wanted you to, I thought it was really important for you to express that because to highlight the fact how important, no matter how great the business is doing, how much you can grow it. If there's partners or people that are not getting along, that is a huge impact on the business, but also the happiness level as well. And so then what ended up happening? Yeah. And, and, and and to your point as well, you know, a, a business relationship, a partnership, it's as if not more important than a marriage right? Like this person or these people, they're your partners. And so if you can't, if you can't be totally transparent and honest with them, if you can't work through all the shit that happens and all the challenges and the ups and downs and celebrate the wins and console each other on the losses, because that's the journey you're going to be on, then it's probably not a relationship worth going on. So what actually ended up happening, and and I'm being super candid with you, I've never actually had this uh, conversation on a podcast before. Um, So let's see how it turns out. But um, (laughs) uh, uh, honestly, there was there was a moment in time where I just said, this is not enough. I rocked up to a meeting, one of the partners um, that I don't particularly speak with today. um, He he actually got physical with me, pushed me. And yeah, and so I just said, you know what? You know, I walked in a week later to the office and I just said, I don't care if you gave me 100% equity in this business, I won't work with you. Because if I can't trust you, if you're not stable as a, as a human being, then nothing is stable. And I don't care how much money 
um, is thrown at me and how much money we can make. And to be honest with you, it wasn't even just that. It was the fact that it wasn't about, it wasn't about how do we add value? How do we create products that support people that they're going to know and love? It's how do we sell shit? And I am not a transactional person. I will put in the time. I will look to build solutions. I'm looking to help people. I'm not looking to take money from people and hope that, you know, people don't figure out that we've swindled them. And so for me, it was really a combination of all of those things where I think from a, an ethos, from a ethical alignment, I wasn't there and no amount of money would have had me change my decision to leave the company at that moment in time. So you made the decision to leave and does that affect your equity at all? I saw nothing. I saw absolutely no, uh, none of the return on the impact I had to business. And to be honest with you, Doc, and I'm going to definitely go with Doc because it just sounds awesome. Um, I, that was, that was a six month journey for me. Um, and I think like one of the things that, you know, for anyone who might be going through a similar situation, the decision I was making is I'm so invested in this. I've done so many hours. I've done so much work. I've, you know, I've actually, you know, it, it was a successful business before, but I built a company with my team. And there's a, there's a fundamental difference when you build in systems and processes and SOPs and training documentation and an infrastructure that enables true growth and scale versus just trying to figure it all out yourself. So for me, the biggest challenge was, you know, do I throw in the towel and give up on all of this sweat equity and investment and the ups and downs that I've the gone and decision. do I start? Yeah. So, so that was, that was it. That was. Well, because also that, they were, I mean, a little of the backstory is they were, you know, looking to sell it as well. So it's not like there was a five-year horizon. It could be, could have been within a year. And I think you end up selling, they end up selling the company, like not short, maybe not shortly after, but, but soon enough after they weren't like, oh, we're going to sell this in 10 years. So you're, you're also making a conscious decision to walk away from that exit. You could have waited it out technically. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So, so we were already having discussions about acquisition or about getting investment and a number of different things. We'd had discussions with brokers and it was never really solidified. Like there was no uh, underlying intent to, we're going to sell in the next six months, but the, the day that I left was the day they made the decision to sell because, and it's not that I'm this genius, special individual. It's just the fact that I was driving sort of the growth of the business in, in terms of scale. And without me, you know, I think they realized pretty quickly that it wasn't, um, it wasn't the same reality with me there versus not. And so that was the decision they made. And about nine months later, it was sold. Mm -hmm. So Yanni is funny because one of my friends, uh, Jim Holtzman, who's been the CFO for some really large companies, helped startup companies. His, I'm going to butcher his saying, but his saying goes something like, you know, with business partners, you have all the bad stuff without the sex. Yeah. And is, you know, so um, he'll probably totally echo your sentiments with that whole partnership situation. And Jim, you can correct me if you're listening to this on what your actual saying is, but um, what were some of the levers you pulled? I, I want to talk after we finish the discussion is what is interesting about a Scala is I want to get your take on the equity piece. Okay. Because I was having a conversation with another agency owner uh, a couple of weeks ago and he's like, you know what? They, they're thinking about carving out, not just doing the service, but like carving out equity, like literally, like you said, you're coming with a strategy, you're coming with the implementation and you're growing this company. Is that appropriate? At, at what point do you think is appropriate? Do you think you'll ever get to that point where like, okay, like we're going to be your consulting arm? Because if you take multiply me and you take a Scala, you're doing the high level consulting process. You're, you're creating um, a infrastructure you know, it may make sense at some point. I know you charge a fee for those, for both of those things. Um, so I'm curious, I want to hear your thoughts on the equity piece, if that ever will come into the conversation or you've thought about it, but hold that thought for a second. But I want to hear, I have to ask about this. So you take a company, help take a company from two to 5 million. What were some of the levers you pulled during that time in a short amount of time? 
Yeah, so I would say the first thing that the first lever pulled was understanding what the hell is going on in this business. You know, like for a lot of Amazon sellers at that point, you know, one, two, even up to about $3 million, there's a lot of, you know, fast paced moving aspects of it. And you've got people sort of, you know, playing um, an absolute multitude of all these different roles and trying it. So what we did was we actually defined what's the actual structure, what's happening inside of the business. So from a marketing perspective, who do we need, right? Who's actually, how do we find professionals that can write the listing copy and the image creation and optimizing these things? How can we have someone who is analytically wired to, you know, to buy the PPC, to take on our methodology and start to, you know, to actually have impact? How do we start to create tracking and insight so that we can actually build for better outcomes. So there was none of that. Um, so my first thing was like what we do inside of Escala is we look to assess how systemized is a business and we look to understand what, what's happening. Until I understood what was happening, which took a bit of time um, because there was a lack of documentation and a lack of insights. It was all sitting in, you know, for a lot of companies at this size, it's sitting in the founder's head. And so they sit there and they understand how everything, but they can't go on a holiday for even 30 seconds because, you know, if anything that's, you know, being built by on, you know, uh, a house of cards here should fall, they need to jump back in. So yeah. the first lever pulled was building out the org strategy and structure, the deployment of specific um, elements, setting up tracking mechanics and understanding what's happening in the business. And from there, I think the first thing that we built out was our, um, was our customer support team. So my co-founder, who I brought in at an early stage in that business, um, effectively went out on to build a 24-hour customer support team where we could answer all queries through Seller Central within a, you know, a max of a six-hour window. So we built out training, documentation, insights, and, you know, just from that little tweak, we stopped seeing, you know, a lot of the negative outcomes happen where things just get left. And, you know, that was the, that, that was probably the, the, the first inroad was that we built a system, we built a team, it was functional, no longer did the founders have to get involved in customer support, which is highly important and valuable, but that's not where you as a founder typically are going to add the most value in a business. Got it. So I'm going to overlay this story with a Scala a little bit. So <clears throat> the first thing you did to the lovers you pulled is you, you came in and assessed, and this is kind of overlay with a Scala too, because probably, you know, the methodology you use, you come in, you assess and you go, cool, what's the, what's the organizational strategy? Who's the team? What's the 80, 20, what's the 20% we need to do right now? And you're like, customer support is lacking and you implement it. So now you assess it, but now the next piece is kind of the implementation, choosing the top 20% of the things that you need to do first and build out, which would be in this situation, the customer source. So another company may be a different, different thing. Um, so after you assess and you choose some of these things to implement, what do you do? What do you do next? Yeah. Well, in that, in that company specifically, it was a, it was a, you know, we were selling at least a quarter of a million products a year. So you can imagine the influx, especially some of the products weren't the most well built. So the influx customer support was high touch, a lot of time, not a lot of value. So we removed that from it. So in terms of a Scala, so also just about our methodology to the Scala company, we've got now 20 management consultants who are ex-EY and Accenture out of the Philippines. And so what we effectively did was we took a lot of the high level methodology from EY and we're also big practice. We, we run on EOS internally. So we've taken a lot of the insights of a lot of smarter people before us and we've built something unique for the e-commerce and Amazon community where we look at our own maturity framework and methodology. So it's evolved a lot since I spent time in that business, but you know, to look at how we look at the world today, we look at how systemized is a business based on your people, process, and technology, how systemized is it? Are, they, are the people in the right seats you know, in their unique abilities really driving? Are the processes really well-defined? Are you using the right pieces of technology? You might have the best piece of technology on planet Earth, 
But unless you understand the processes and have the people yeah. to drive that piece of technology, you don't have a true solution. So, you know, in terms of the methodology is we, we are looking to identify what happens in the business as a baseline. We build out process maps of the current state of the business. And then we start to garner insights into, you know, based on people, process and technology, what are the levers that can be pulled to optimize them? How do we build the future state process maps to optimize the business, removing the most critical people from the least valuable tasks and putting them into spots where they're going to, you know, thrive in their unique ability. So I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, you know, one thing I want to give a shout out to Gino Wickman, um, who's been on the podcast to so check out his episode and his book traction is, is phenomenal. So, um, yeah, he's the EOS methodology is, is really helped a lot, many, many businesses, um, as far as that goes. And, you know, I want to talk about from a Scala point, what you worked with a company, there was a lot of, what were some of the issues you did identify that were big, big levers? Um, first and talk about that yeah um i mean i could talk about my experience since it's it's funny you know it's not a whole lot of time that's passed you know we're talking 2018 19 you know i left that business you know in in you know classical terms that's not that long ago but in the span of e-commerce and what's happened given the pandemic and the push to you know, the advancements and where we've gotten to, I feel like it's worlds apart today in terms of what we deliver and, and where we're at. Um, so I can talk to you about some of the levers that I pulled there. Or I can talk to you yeah. about some, some of the things that, that we do today. That Yeah, you know, well, you were the, mentioning when, before we hit record, you work with the company and there were, there were a number of issues that you identified for that company that really made a huge difference in their business. And you could talk generally because I'm sure it's, you know, privy to that particular business, but as an example, what were, what were, you probably see some common issues, I imagine. Yeah. So I'll say that inside of Escala, you know, they've really taken this to a whole nother level and, you know, it's, it's not even a true reflective of where we sit today as, as delivery. But what I can tell you from my personal experience is that, um, and this is common, these are some of the things that we see with the businesses we support today, but you know, one of the common, um, you know what, I'll call it a mistake because I think it is a mistake here, is that a lot of founders of Amazon and e-commerce brands, they'll invest all of their time into their hero product or their top three, right? And for us as a business, we did the same initially. It was the same issue. We had one product. It was doing honestly close to $2 million at, at its peak. And what we failed to do is give all of our products the same level of attention and love that that one product got. And so it's the classic hero product issue. So the first thing that we did is we identified and defined the processes that went into investing in that hero product and why it was as good as it was. And then we found a way to hire the right people to sit in the seats based on their roles and responsibilities and their accountability chart and I didn't even also pay homage to, to Gino, but you know, the guy has had uh, a, a hugely impactful, um, well, a, a huge impact on my life professionally and personally and our business success and, um, and for a lot of other companies that we work with too. So yeah, just to say, I can't wait to listen to that episode and um, who knows, maybe one day I can get Gino on my uh, podcast. But uh, the point, the point I was making about it was that, um, we built a system that enabled us for our, we had about 35, 40 SKUs to pull the same levers on the top one, two, three products across the board. And so as a result, instead of just growing our revenue and our profitability across one, two, three SKUs, we could do it across 35 and 40. So that was a, a fundamental is the level of attention that we could give to the entire product suite. So that's one mistake you see people making is really just paying attention to the back, you know, just keeping that going, but not really outlining and mapping out what they did to get it to that point and doing it with the other products. Yeah, that would be one. Yeah. I can give you prob I can give you problems and insights for days if you want. I mean, another one, another one that um, comes to mind as well is very much about management of people. I mean, I have a, a podcast called Successful Scales where I interview people on what it takes to build successful businesses. 
And, you know, one of the things that keeps coming up and one of the things that I saw as a fundamental uh, challenge inside of that business was that, you know, you have founders or senior management simply telling people what to do and having them stick with inside of their lanes rather than really giving them true accountability and responsibility around the business objective or their responsibility inside of the business that ladders up to the higher business objective and setting them free. So, you know, one of the things we changed is that we gave people autonomy and authority and an ability to make suggestions and make changes. And, you know, these are the people, these are your, I mean, I wouldn't even call them your foot soldiers. These are the people that are driving your business. You know, the person that thinks, and it, you know, it always stick in my mind. Like I used to be told all the time, like we are the business, like us as the, you know, two or three owners of the business, we're the business. And I could not disagree more. You know, I am, I am my responsibility in the business. Is how do I work for everyone else? How do I support them to have the most impact inside of the business and anything I can do to help enable them to achieve more is that's my objective. It doesn't matter about me. I'm just, I'm just one other person playing my part in our collective goal. And for us now it's about creating jobs. And that for me is a driving is the driving for how many how many lives have we touched to have positive impact and put food on people's table? So the leadership piece, you know, making sure people have the autonomy and authority to make decisions so that the owner, whoever is not a bottleneck in in things. What's another one that you see? Yeah. So, you know, it kind of ladders into what I was talking about before, but the the building out the processes. So, you know, the one biggest risk that you have as a business owner is to have a dependency or a reliance on a single linchpin. So, you know, if I look at it, um, I want to keep everyone, I want to grow everyone, but I also don't want to at the same time be totally beholden to if someone leaves or they don't. So building out the processes and the step-by-step -step guide as to how things are, are done and building also a backup as well so that two people know how to do each of the functions that enables true scale and it, you know stops you from being totally dependent on any one individual in a business yeah i want to point out uh, a friend owen who's founder of sweet process actually is a software just a shout out to owen and what they do they're a software people use to actually document the systems so it makes it super drop that easy to train staff onboard staff and all of that so uh, if anyone out there is looking for a solution, I mean, there's Google, I mean, people use Google docs, but this is actually a more sophisticated, better, uh, solution than just a Google document fired up. So everyone can check out sweet process, but, um, I wanted to talk, you know, so now we have the, you know, the Scala, which you have these, you know, can lay out the strategy, the processes, all these things. And then you have multiply me. Okay. And multiply me is you know, actually staffing solutions at affordable prices that people can, can use, right? So um, talk a little about what are the, the functions, the use cases that you've seen for Multiply Me? Yeah, so for Multiply Me, and this was sort of the light bulb moment that I had working and building that Amazon business was that, you know, I am someone who has worked in the space for my entire career. I know what a good designer looks like, a good developer, copywriter, you know, content creator, whatever it is. And I used to invest 20, 30 hours a week searching things I, I like to call uh, onlinejobs.ph, like the gateway drug to the Philippines. You know, I used to scour all these different platforms, Upwork, FreeUp, Freelancer.com, Speed, like you name it. And what I realized was, um, and even though I even did a year of recruitment or headhunting, um, that wasn't my unique ability. I didn't have the patience for it. And I would spend 20 to 30 hours and I'd maybe hire one person, hired a recruiter and understood that I would have two to three hours a week of interviews and I'd hire two out of three people. You know, he understood it. He had 10, 15 years experience in recruitment and it totally shifted my perception. So Multiply Me as a business handles the end-to-end -end executive search and the critical HR function that most businesses, you know, never even get to the size of to have a deep appreciation as to what it means to have regular performance management, understanding sort of like what those cadences are to build the KPIs and expectations and going in so that everyone's aligned. So um, 
one of the, I would say our first client ever still to this day. And it's funny, like as we are in market for longer and longer, the earlier clients are the ones that typically see the greatest success because it's just time. It's time in market, time working together. But our first client ever, he was a freelancer PPC specialist um, on, uh, he was doing Google AdWords. And today he has a team of, I believe about eight uh, through Multiply Me, where between Escala and Multiply Me, we helped build out his onboarding, performance management, and everything in between, his training videos, documentation. We built him an infrastructure and a system to train people. He has a great ability to win clients. He just couldn't staff them and he felt he couldn't, he couldn't articulate well enough how to actually have mm. anyone else do the work. So we built that in for him. And today, like I said, he's got eight or nine people in his team um, from senior PPC specialists to PPC to media buyers. He's built an SEO arm. And so I guess the success is that um, giving people that understanding that there, are infra there is an infrastructure and an ability to grow a team if you're guided through the right way and you have the proper onboarding documentation and people understand who they should be reporting to and who their line manager is and if they've got issues and if there's a performance improvement uh, requirement that an HR function can serve that and help guide you through sort of the, the murky waters because there's like the, the manager and the employee and having an HR function serves as that person that can have those sort of conversations that might not feel as comfortable and they can almost be the middleman to solve for X. So Yanni, get a little granular with me. What type of positions can someone go to multiply me? And just to let people know, it's multiply them, mii.com, multiply mii.com. And you can check out their website and what they're doing. What positions, like someone's like, okay, I'm looking for this position or that position. What are the common positions people use and hire, uh, you know, use your company to hire for? Yeah, so so I'll, I'll make the statement that um, if you're looking for a VA, you know, like if you're looking for someone who does a little bit of data entry, sure, we could find that for you, but that's not who we are in our DNA. What we are is where the access point to real professional talent. So we do a lot of headhunting. We find people who are in jobs, in you know, professional roles in the Philippines, corporate Philippines. And some of the roles include inventory and logistics, supply chain, operations managers. Like real creative direct stuff. Yeah, designers, yeah. developers, customer support, um, you know, really the gamut of anything that's going to touch on the yeah. e-commerce and agency space is, is our sweet spot. But I guess the the underlying thing is that it, it's it's real professionals um, because the only way we see true growth is where you have someone who is a dedicated resource and an employee of the company living and breathing your culture that's going to enable growth. You know, there's definitely a place for freelancers, but not when it's your core. For, like we try to freelance a project manager and it's very hard when you have, you know, them working on multiple companies and multiple projects if they're not really living and breathing it every day. Yeah. So. I encourage people to check out multiplymimii.com. You can go to their page and you can search, okay, I'm looking for accounting. I'm looking for Amazon. I'm looking for e-commerce. I'm looking for content. You know, I'm looking for customer support, voice or non. So you have all these categories that people can check out. Developer, human resources, marketing. So check it out if you're looking for someone. Uh, we're all, you know, a lot of people are looking for someone. Check it out and, and, and um, you know, just poke around. But I guess, you know, for that, is this someone then, okay, I'm looking, is this only, okay, I need a full-time person. Um, so when they're going to use like, cool, this is a full-time person or is it okay if I need 20 hours, it's still full-time, you just get 20 hours. How does that, that work as far as what people, you know, how, what their hours are looking for match? Yeah, so I'd say most of our clients, like the 90 percentile, potentially even plus would be full-time uh, team members. Got it. We do go as low as 20 hours a week um, for for people in special cases. But I think, you know, just as a as a philosophy, giving someone full time, a full time opportunity, living and breathing your business and your culture has lasting impact and has them really, you know, live, breathe, die, bleed for your for your vision and your business. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, Yanni, I want to be the first one to thank you. Um, I think you know, it's really 
thank you for sharing um, some of the the hard times because oftentimes in that you know it's a learning opportunity. We didn't get your thoughts on the equity. I know there's another call going on, so you know um, you'll just have to ask them. Uh, but I want to encourage people to go to Multiply Me. MII.com. You can check out we are Escala, E S C A L A.com. Is there any other places we should point people online? You don't need to check you out. Do you know what? If you guys are looking to learn as well, I'd say check out successfulscales.com. And that's me interviewing people on what it takes to grow big businesses. So um, that's something for me that, you know, the, the logic for me was. I'm trying to learn as quickly as I can. So I may as well hit record. And while I'm asking questions, you know, have everyone else learn along with me as to what it takes to build some of the bigger businesses. And, you know, I've spoken to a lot of the aggregators and the roll-ups and I feel like, Doc, you'd be a great guest. So we'll have to get you on there too. Cool. Check out that. Check out the website. Check out Rise25. Check out more episodes of the inspiredinsider.com. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Yanni. Thank you. What I got